hit one of the, the pieces of scripture that I think is so misunderstood and so oftentimes um, mistaught. Uh, but we're going to start off by going to the birth of Christ. We're in the, the Gospel of, of Matthew. Um, and let's get some historical culture under our belt. Uh, when a man and a woman at the time of Christ uh, became engaged, the community viewed them effectively at that time as being married. Um, and the, uh, still, they would domicile with their respective parents. Um, after a period, though, of one year, um, one year's wait, the groom would arrive at his bride's house in full regalia to take his bride and consummate the marriage. The waiting period was so that each party could show that they were chaste, uh, that they uh, had the, the fortitude to remain faithful to one another, and that they were individuals of integrity, of honor. So jumping in, um, verse 18, now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah was, as the birth of Jesus, the Messiah was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, since he was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. You're going to fall in love with Joseph, guys. You are going to absolutely uh, he proves himself to be such a loving man of honor. With Mary pregnant, he could have taken her to the judges at the, the gates of the city, where they would probably have ordered her to be stoned to death. Um, instead, he writes her a bill of divorce and plans to send her out of the village, basically to be able to give her a new start on life. And he did this. Guys, think about this. He did this with an utterly broken heart. I mean, if your girlfriend, your fiance, becomes pregnant, the first thing that you say to yourself is, it must have been that Holy Spirit. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, his heart had to have been broken. And he's going out of his way here to protect Mary and to be able to give her a new start where she would still have a sense of honor, even though he was thinking she had been unfaithful. Verse 20, but when they had, he had thought this over, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Quote, unquote. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his dream and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary his wife. This is really important. It's easy, so easy to skip over this. He took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Now, this is one of those things where you're just going to fall in love with Joseph. He short-circuited the betrothal process. They weren't one year in yet, and took Mary into his house immediately. Now, what he was doing here was protecting her reputation because people would soon see that she was pregnant. And the villagers would probably assume then that Joseph had taken advantage of her, uh, protecting her reputation. Do you guys see the beauty in that? I mean, that's real masculinity. Um, that's a guy who, you know, we've seen demonstrated twice now a hyper love for this gal. Um, I just, I just absolutely love, love his character. So the visit of the, visit of the Magi. Now, uh, here's a, here's a party trick, and I can guarantee you can make money off of this one, um, especially after people are on about their third glass of wine. Um, say, how many wise men were there? Everybody. 
everybody's going to say three, right? Mm -hmm. Then hand them the New Testament and say, prove it. Because nowhere does it say there were three of them. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Again, there's no note of how many wise men there are here. But so many people learn their names in Sunday school, even though it's never mentioned in Scripture. Um, the assumption is... Yeah. Where did that come from then? What? That's exactly what I was going to get to. The assumption is because there were three different gifts that were given, that it was three different individuals. It's not a bad assumption. It's not a good assumption. It's just an assumption. It's just an assumption. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can make a little bit of money on the party trip there. Um, so the truth is we don't know how many. Uh, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. Well, of course, because he could trouble all of Jerusalem. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophets. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among our leaders of Judah. For from you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, and Herod's not a great guy, secretly called for the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report back to me, so that I, too, can come and worship him. Yeah, right. Uh, after hearing the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went on ahead of them until it came to stop over the place where the child was to be found. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. I love this, guys. These aren't Jews. Um, more than likely, they were Zoroastrians. Mm -hmm. um, and the first people to worship Jesus were outside of the people of Abraham. Um, wow. Uh, now, typically, this is taught that it's either the night of or just a few weeks after the birth of Christ. However, there are a few things that let us know that probably wasn't when we celebrate um, a fifth week. Um, first, Mary and Joseph are now in a house. It's not a stable anymore. Um, it's not a manger. Um, and the word that's used to refer to Christ here in the Greek is paidan, which means child, as opposed to brekos, which means baby or newborn. The words have changed here. Um, so in all likelihood, this is probably about two years, more or less, after the birth of Christ. Um, then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And after being warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, you're going to love Jesus, uh, Joseph again here. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. I don't know about you guys, but I like to plan things. You know, um, I like to have a general idea of what's going to be happening. Uh, because I like this absolute illusion of control. Um, look at this guy Joseph again. 
And I mean, he is a man of action. And he listens to the word of the Lord. Yeah, I love the guy. And the gifts that they had received could have easily financed their journey and stay in Egypt. Uh, so he stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened so that what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Verse 16. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became enraged and sent men and killed all the boys who were in Bethlehem and all of its vicinity, who were two years old or under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. That would be when they first saw the, the star. So two years or under. Um, that's why, again, many scholars believe that Jesus was probably about two years old at this time. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah and the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Think of this, guys. I mean, uh, we've, we talked a lot about trauma. I mean, we've talked a lot about trauma on Tuesday. Think of the trauma for an entire city where every male child under two years old was murdered. Um, and that's just uh, horrific. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Um, just a side note, Archelaus was a really bad guy. Um, he made his father look like a good guy. Um, really bad guy. Uh, then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee and came and settled in a city called Nazareth. This happened so that what was spoken through the prophets would be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. Now, why is this meaningful at all? It's hugely, hugely meaningful. Nazareth was the town that housed the Roman garrison for the northern part of Galilee. Um, this is the big military town for the Romans. Uh, so most Jews would not have anything to do with the city, and those Jews that did live there were considered by everybody else in Israel as compromisers who consorted with the enemy. Therefore, to be called a Nazarene, that's an insult. Um, that's, that's being called a traitor. Um, so, yeah. So let's move on to this uh, very interesting guy called John. John the Baptist. I don't know how many times I have several friends who are pastors in the Baptist church. I don't know how many times I've heard them say that their church goes back to John the Baptist. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. But this guy is radical. Um, absolutely radical. Now in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, who's when he said, The voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Here's the radical nature of this. The idea of entering the kingdom was a familiar one to the Jews, and they thought that it was a birthright because they were descendants of Abraham. Well, if it's your birthright, do you have to repent? No. I mean, this is something completely new, a completely new idea. Um, the idea of repentance as a factor for entrance into the kingdom. Now, John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So John the Baptist basically hearkened back to 
as a type of Elijah, right? I mean, Elijah was a rough outdoorsman, uh, very direct message, you know, very, very much like John the Baptist here. At that time, Jerusalem was going out to him and all of Judea and all the region around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming from baptism, get this, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Now, everybody here is also in the best too. Mm -hmm. What's he saying? You start Satan. Yeah. Satan. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance and do not assume that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. And the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is being cut down and thrown into the fire. These are the lawyers. These are the super religious guys. Do you think they're used to people talking to them like this? Do you think they're used to somebody talking to them like this in public? This is a big deal. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then we come to something that had always perplexed me, and I got a chance, and I really was grateful for the chance this past week to study this a little bit more. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. Now, wait a minute. John's baptism is calling for repentance, right? And Jesus is showing up at the Jordan to be baptized. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have the need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. Uh, but Jesus answered and said to him, Allow it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Here's the poignancy, guys. I mean, here's the absolute poignancy. From what did Jesus need to repent? Absolutely nothing. Why should he get baptized? The foreshadowing here is of when he would take all of our transgressions upon himself. When he would become sin in the eyes of the Father. And that's how closely he is choosing to identify with us. When he would effectively become our sin on our behalf, paying the price, he was identifying with sinners. As a sinner. Yeah? Um, I have a question. Um, so if that's a foreshadowing, I'm not saying it as a person, I'm just asking. Um, so that's the only time cross that God couldn't, he couldn't be there because he couldn't handle the sin. But when he was being baptized, he came and said, he, he appeared during that. So yes. that kind of Okay, yeah, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, when Christ was on the cross, um, he couldn't, uh, God the Father couldn't actually look upon him at that time because all the sin of the world was on him. Uh, but how about what we're coming up to? Uh, Connie asked the question, what we're coming up to is when we're going to see here 
Matter of fact, I'm just going to skip ahead to that and answer your question in that time. Uh, uh, then he allowed him, after he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and settling on him. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Guys, this is the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together at one time. The baptism is now complete. Um, and that's, you know, so there was no sin at all on Christ. It was just, you know, it then basically a, a, a foreshadowing of what would happen um, when he took the sin, our sin, upon himself. Um, so we talked, um, I think it was this week, on that's Duke on the nature of evil. We talked about uh, Eve's and Adam's uh, temptation. Now we're going to look at the temptation of Jesus, and we're going to see some similarities and a pretty big difference. Uh, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Something else to note here about evil. Temptations often come when we are weak and when we have a need, real or perceived. Um, when we are weak and when we have a need, real or perceived, that is unmet. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Obviously, huh? But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil said, uh, took him along to, into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacles of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and on their hands they will lift you up, so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Okay, well, here's the nature of this temptation. Um, the, the Jewish tradition stated, and this was tradition, it wasn't scripture, the tradition stated that when the Messiah would appear, he would magically appear in the temple, bolting down from the heavens, rocketing down from the sky. The temptation for Christ here was to be instantly recognized as the Messiah, shortcutting his work, and then becoming a political instead of spiritual Messiah. Does that make sense? This would have been a huge temptation. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him along to a very high mountain and showed him, all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Again, Satan saying, I can accomplish the will of God for you in a much easier fashion. And don't we want sometimes the will of God for us in the easiest fashion? Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to serve him. Now let's compare this to the temptation narrative we looked at on Tuesday. Um, though Satan misquoted the word of God several times, um, unlike Eve, who misquoted God's one command, Jesus knew his scripture, didn't he? Yeah, Jesus knew his scripture and was able to answer, able to rebuff through his knowledge of scripture. A little convicting to me. I was teaching, uh, <laughs> I was teaching, uh, and then I was teaching in Argentina a while back, two years back, and one of the students came up to us and said, have you memorized the book of Romans yet? Um, no. 
that was one of those, okay, maybe I shouldn't be on teaching. Um, Jesus begins his ministry, verse 32. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew from Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the reason, uh, region of Zebulon and Naphtali. This happened so that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled, quote unquote, the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, uh, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in the darkness saw a great light and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now it's easy to gloss over this. This is an area heavily populated by Gentiles. Heavily populated by Gentiles. John the Baptist is now in prison, but Jesus is keeping on the message, keeping the message going forward, that the lineage of Abraham was not the ticket to the kingdom of heaven. A right relationship with God was. Verse 18. Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Uh, you guys know what the name Peter means, right? Basically, it's rocky. You know, uh, be, it's something that we ascribe to a guy who's kind of a tough guy, not uh, rocky. Uh, and you should have this lecture down in Chicago where the net. I <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. We should have a lecture down in Chipala where the uh, fishermen are. That would be fun, actually. Um, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers and men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus was going about in all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. Okay, a mention of miracles here. We'll touch on miracles and their nature a little bit uh, uh, later, but the mention of here is of teaching and healing. Uh, Jesus was giving authentication to his authority to teach through the healings. Um, you know, it makes sense. What's, what's easier to do? Trust me, I'm a great prophet. I'm going to teach you. Listen to me. Or, trust me, I'm a great prophet. Let me heal this guy. And then, once I've taken care of the needs of all the people here, um, stick around and listen. I have something to say. Of course, you know, it's an authentication. And the news about him spread throughout Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and severe pain, demon-possessed, people with epilepsy, people who were paralyzed, and he healed them. There's, he's showing authority here, not only over physical infirmity, but also casting out demons, um, big time miracles. Large crowds uh, followed him from Galilee, and the Decapolis, and Jerusalem, and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Now we get to the Sermon on the Mount. And this is one of the most, in my opinion, mistaught passages in all of Scripture. It comes across sounding graceless, if it's mistaught. It comes across sounding incredibly strict. Um, but we're going to see the love of God shining through here. Um, now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. The Pharisees had parsed out the law to a ridiculous, ridiculous degree, um, counting how many steps you could walk from your house or, you know, on Sunday, or actually Saturday, um, on Saturday, and have it not be work. But if you had a backpack, you could walk as far as you wanted because your house was on your back. I mean, 
they, they parsed this stuff out to absolutely absurd degrees and taught that outward behavior was the key to salvation, regardless of what was going on in one's heart. And here, Jesus is turning the table, saying that the heart of the man is the heart of the matter. The heart of the man is the heart of the matter, because if the heart is pure, good actions then flow from that. Jesus is going to start with our attitude towards ourselves, then move on to our attitudes to our failings, and then move on to our attitudes towards the world, and end up with our attitude towards the Lord. Let's look. We're going to see a beautiful progression here with one beatitude building on the other. And this is why I say this is so often miscommunicated, mistaught. Um, because we're going to see a progression. The Beatitudes build on each other. Um, so he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor, blessed means happy, uh, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word translated here, poor in spirit, um, it doesn't mean what usually pops into mind. It doesn't mean wimpy. Um, it doesn't mean... Um, lacking in character. It means humble, which in the Greek translated as, and this is important, having a correct estimate of one's self. Excuse me. Having a correct estimate of one's self. The person who has a correct estimate of themselves sees, yes, their strengths, but also sees their need for God, for His grace, because they see their failings. And therefore, theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Now he moves on to our attitude towards our sin, our errors. Because when you have an accurate estimate of yourself, you see your shortcomings. Blessed are those, happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. To mourn means literally to lament. So having taken an accurate stock of ourselves, we are not, um, we're, uh, to note our shortcomings, where we fall short of the glory of God, and lament that, which leads then to the next one. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. This is really, really mistranslated. Um, but we get into the habits, and so that's what happens. The word translated here as gentle refers literally to a war horse that is properly bridled. An incredible strength, but totally yielded to its master. Do you see the progression here? I mean, isn't it just amazing to look at this not as onesies, but as a chapter of progression. Um, incredible strength, totally yielded to this master. This flows from the lamenting of our transgressions, as we then allow God to control our lives, power under the control of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. As we yield ourselves, then, to God's control, we shall yearn to be more like him. And God will answer that. That's grace. That's unmerited favor. God will answer that. But they will be satisfied. The next three verses focus on our attitude towards the Lord. Sorry. Yeah. Um, as Sorry. you said, as we, uh, as we yield to God's control. What was the next bit? Mm -hmm. As we yield to, I'm sorry? As we yield to God's control. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me go back to that. Um, as we yield to God's control, um, uh, we then allow God to control our lives, the power, you know, God's power or power under the control of God. As we yield our strength to God's control, we shall learn to be, yearn, excuse me, to be more like Him. Does that make sense? Well, hunger and thirst for his righteousness. Yes, yeah, we're going to hunger and thirst for his righteousness. We're going to yearn to be more like him. 
And so the next few verses focus on our attitude towards the Lord, or our attitude towards the Lord is needed out in how we then treat others. Uh, how do we treat others? Having received mercy and peace, we are to share mercy and peace. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now this is flowing again, isn't it, for, from blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. God's fulfilling that. Um, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. I love this. Um, the word here, merciful, um, translated literally, means actively it doesn't mean just if you happen to see a need, you might step forward and meet it. It means this is the kind of person who looks for the needs, who seeks out the needs of others so that they can step in and be used to meet that need. Um, and the word peace means here um, means one who enters a situation and actively seeks to make peace. It's not just a tranquil dude, you know, but one who actively seeks to manufacture peace. Now we move on to the next progression, having had a true understanding of ourselves, then lamenting our shortfalls, we yield our strength to God, and as we do so, uh, he makes us more like him, which sets us less and less to be like the world. We become less and less like the world. And if that takes place, do we really expect that the world is going to treat us better than it treated the Son of God? Well, here's the truth. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As you become more like me, you're going to be persecuted. But take this to heart. That means yours is the kingdom of heaven. You're coming in as an inheritor, not as a guest. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Well, there was a certain false witness against Christ, wasn't there? Yeah. Should we expect less? Uh, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is in a very big way then equating those individuals for whom these beatitudes are internalized as prophets, isn't it? The prophets who came before you. When we share in the sufferings of Christ, we are told we will share in his glory as well. I got crosswise uh, with an elder born in Atlanta with a church, one of the churches where I was senior pastor. Um, the elder board took a highly, highly political view of the church um, and sought to legislate and use boycotts to change people's outward behavior. What people group does this remind us of that John the Baptist had some words with? Yeah. There was, back then, um, some nut job judge that installed a large statue of the Ten Commandments in the courthouse in Alabama. Pastor Ted, you need to lead a march on the courthouse in Alabama. We insist on it. Why? Well, because the federal uh, government has ordered that the Ten Commandments be taken out of the courthouse. You need to lead a march. No. What do you mean? No. We had a heated discussion. I refused their instructions, and in one of my less politically savvy moments, I blurted out, 
Look, guys, I am sure that there's more sincere, honest prayer that takes place in that courthouse than has ever taken place on this elder board. I'm sure. I still stand by the statement. Kurt Vonnegut. Did you guys know him as a believer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The guy who wrote Slaughterhouse Five mm -hmm. um, and so many other wonderful books. Kurt Vonnegut said it much more politically correctly than I did to the elder board. When he wrote, for some reason, the most vocal Christians among us never mention the Beatitudes, Matthew 5. But often with tears in their eyes, they demand that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings. And that, of course, is Moses, not Jesus. Bonnie goes on. I haven't heard one of them demand that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, be posted anywhere. Blessed are the merciful, posted in a courthouse. Blessed are the peacemakers, posted We see God's grace. And from our accurate assessment of ourselves showing that we need it, to our lamentations over our shortcomings, resulting in yielding all of who we are to Christ, giving ourselves to Him, and with Him then interjecting in our lives to make us more like Him, which in turn pushes us into the world, in turn to share His mercy bring his peace and that shows in the Holy Spirit's work in our lives because it flows the behaviors flow from what is inside of us to outward behaviors not the other way around the way the Pharisees had it. you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has become tasteless, how can we be salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. Salt makes people thirsty. It imparts flavor. It brings purification. Salt is magic. Um, and in the time of Christ, people stored salt in canvas bags. Why? Well, this is kind of a fun little aside. Because it was a salt shaker. You could take the bag over your food, boop, 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 and since it's canvas, salt comes out the bottom. You know, so it's a salt shaker. Um, but if you store the salt in a canvas bag and don't use it for a long period of time, well, humidity gets to the salt, and the salt itself is leached out and leaves a white residue that looks like salt. It looks like salt. Um, how many people who come to church every Sunday look like believers? You know, but where's the salt? Um, so, salt needs to be out of the salt shaker, doesn't it? To have effect. Absolutely. That pertains to us, too. Yes, it's good to spend our time a certain amount of our time in church. It is wonderful to fellowship together. We had a great time of fellowship yesterday afternoon. Wonderful to fellowship with each other. But if that's the only place where we take, spend our time, how are we going to interact with the world? How are we going to not fall into the trap of having the actual salt leach out of us? We're supposed to bring Flavor. We're supposed to make people thirsty. We're supposed to have an impact of purification. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may seek your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Guys, this is not a political admonition. 
Um, so often stateside, I don't know if you guys had this in, in the problem in Australia, so often stateside, you know, you have people saying, our country is a city on a hill. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, a matter of fact, the United States is the most warlike country on the face of the planet for the history of the world. Um, it's not a city on a hill. Um, you can't have a Christian nation. You can't have a Christian bookstore. You can have a bookstore that appeals to Christians, where their primary market is to Christians, but people are Christians. Not cities, not countries, people. It's not a good fact that definition. Yes, and that's a really good question. Kevin asked about that. What about Israel? Um, well, let me just slide that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Is Israel um, a nation of God's chosen people? Yes. Technically, Israel is a secular nation. Um, their constitution is a secular constitution. Um, however, one of our good friends from back in graduate school. Um, she is, her sister is a member of parliament uh, in Israel, and her best friend is a member of parliament in Gaza. Um, she has some complex relationships that she is working through. Um, yeah, the Israelites are God's chosen people, um, and we'll get into that um, in detail later on. Um, but I need to make it very clear that um, a lot of people will say, well, the church is Israel now. Well, no, Israel is Israel. Um, we've been grafted in. You know, That's uh, replacement theology, right? Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, um, the church is the church. And, uh, but yes, it, but that would also be a theocracy. Uh, and uh, um, there were many, many attempts to have quote unquote Christian nations. Um, did they ever work out well? Um, no. Our free will gets in the way. I'm sorry? Our free will gets in the way. Yeah, our free will gets in the way, and we become Pharisees. Um, that's, that's just the nuts and bolts of it. So, I mean, very good questions, guys. I mean, very, very good questions. Um, so, what we see here, um, Christ has just told his disciples, his audience, I mean, uh, that their righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. Well, this is a radical message to these people. The teacher of the law, you know. Here's the pinnacle. You guys have been looking at the pinnacle and believing this is the pinnacle for all of your life. Now he goes on and raises the bar. He says, and they fall short. Again, reinforcing that the heart of the man is the heart of the man. Chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard the ancients were told, you shall not murder. Whoever commits murder shall be answerable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be answerable to the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be answerable to the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. How many people did I murder this morning on my drive? You know, uh, yeah. Can I just ask, like, those saying those things in our cultures, nothing. Yes. Yeah. Is there a cultural significance to those particular phrases as to why it's such a. Rocco uh, uh, yeah. is the word that's translated as fool. And Raka was a common insult of the day. Right. Um, and yeah, um, these are these are very common insults. It's kind of like now it's yeah. It's odd. You look at someone here, man, that was an idiot. Oh yeah. And, and that was the exact same thing in this time. Um, you know, it's kind of flipping somebody off. I mean, how many times have we seen people flip, flip each other off? Well, yeah. this is. I mean, Jesus is raising the bar here to an enormous standard. He's saying, you can't do it. 
You know, right. they parsed out, these guys parsed out the law to such a degree, um, and you look up at them, and yeah. So is the point then that we actually need a savior? We can't do it by ourselves. Like we cannot fulfill these. Exactly. Yeah. So we need Jesus. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin's question is um, is the point here that we can't do it ourselves. Absolutely. Okay. He's pointing out that the bar is so much higher than anybody. It's has. impossible for us to meet it. Exactly. Exactly. And we get worse. we get emotional and just mm -hmm. say those things. Like, oh yeah. Well, and I think that's the other point that he's making in making those comparisons between the Pharisees and what the law actually meant is he's going, you're talking outward behavior. I'm talking what's internal. Right, right. What's coming from your heart. Yeah, the purpose of the law, you know, we're going to see this as we get further and further into um, uh, the Pentateuch. The purpose of the law was to point out our need for God. Um, it wasn't to create an outward behavior which is made of unobtaining of it. <laughs> you know? Um, made utterly of unobtaining. Um, it gets worse here. Um, I love this. It gets worse. And wait, there's more. It proves that we have to have the Holy Spirit work in us mm -hmm. to transform us into His image. I mean, because we can't do it ourselves. So if we don't let the Holy Spirit change our heart, mm -hmm. then we're, we're going to have Exactly. Yeah, Kant is exactly. saying, you know, we need the Holy Spirit working uh, to change us, transform us. And I love how you use the word transform because it is transformative. Culture tries to conform us. It tries to pressure us to take a certain shape. Think then on the, we have tons of monarchs in our, in our uh, uh, garden because we have a bunch of milkweed. Um, think then of what's going on in that chrysalis. It is a transformation not a confirmation. Uh, transformation, not a confirmation. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering, I love this piece because we as a culture, Kevin, you're going to resonate with this, I know. Um, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first to be reconciled to your brother. And then come and present your offering. God is so much more concerned about how we treat each other. And this is basically saying, apologize. Our culture stinks at apologies. Oh, I offended this person, so I'm going to be really, really nice to them for the next three or four days. And that will make up for it. That's not an apology. An apology is taking responsibility. It's putting on one's big boy pants or big girl pants and saying, I did that, and it was wrong. And I hurt you. I love our language here in Mexico. Lo siento does not mean I'm sorry. Lo siento means I feel. I feel the pain I caused you. I feel what I did to you. That's an apology. Uh, we are so consumed with judging and that's hurting each other. That, that's, like, that's our main focus, um, especially in America. Like we take on God-like nature of judging everybody and, and putting them down and telling them how to live their life, when that in itself isn't right. Exactly. Uh, Tanya is making a good point here. When we when we choose to judge others, we're taking on a mantle that isn't ours. It's God's. Um, but we like to keep score, don't we? And yeah, that's that's why we like the rules and ranks. But God places such a high value here. He's saying. The real worship is being reconciled to your brother. That's what I want you to do first. The real worship is reestablishing that relationship um, and apology. And purity of heart. Purity of heart. Come to good terms with your accuser quickly. That assumes the person's guilty, doesn't it? Your accuser, not me. I'm guilty. 
uh, while you are with him on the way to the court, so that your accuser will not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you will not be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrants. You have heard it say that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, our outward actions don't make the grade. What Christ is stressing here is we can't do it. He is harboring back, hearkening back to the Beatitudes, instructing us on how then to have an accurate assessment of ourselves. It's not just, did I commit murder? No? Okay, I'm a great guy. Did I flip the guy off behind me because he was tailgating? Don't you think did it's a, a gracious way for him to point out how Satan tempts us. Yes. Yeah. Like with the love of the eyes and, mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's just a beautiful example yeah. of his love. That's exactly what we're trying to say. Isn't that a gracious way of God saying, you know, how, how we can be tempted? It, it is. Well, it's, it's a very gracious way of him instructing us on how to step to that first beatitude, how to have an accurate, accurate assessment of ourselves. Um, now, if your right eye is causing you to sin, tear it out and throw it away from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Well, our eyes and our hands are, frankly, so often what get us into trouble, aren't they? Uh, but Jesus is not advocating here physical self-mutilation. Uh, for obviously, can a blind man still lust? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can a one-handed man still grab some bubble gum, put it in his pocket, and not pay for it? Absolutely. But what Jesus is doing instead is giving a methodology on how do we interact with those parts of our nature which are clearly, clearly wrong. Uh, how do we deal with sin? And that is that we don't try to taper it off. Okay, I lifted uh, five pieces of bubble gum today. That's wrong. I'm sorry. Tomorrow I'll only do four. Um, let's see. I lusted after 32 women today. Tomorrow I'll make it 31. See, I flipped off five people today. Tomorrow, I'll only flip off four. No. He's saying, deal with it. Deal with it with immediacy. Now, it was said, whoever sends his wife away is to give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, and that was, again, instructions by the Pharisees. I find this very, very interesting. The Pharisees are making it very, very easy for a man to send his wife away. Uh, all these tough, tough rules for everybody. But no, no, no. Send her away. Give her a certificate. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. God hates divorce. Interestingly, the Pharisees wanted to make the divorce very, very easy for men. This is gendered. This is definitely gendered. I mean, don't you, the times were different too, though, because they had more than one wife, and kind of, I mean, it was just, um, I just wonder, because of the, the, the difference in how things were, the cultural differences um, back then. There were cultural differences. Most people, though, were um, uh, monogamous. Uh, there were exceptions, obvious often exceptions. Uh, Solomon. <laughs> Ooh, right. um, but Solomon had his one true love, the Shulamite, you know. Um, but I'm also saying that we have gone a little over an hour, and my throat is starting to feel it. So let's make it a five-minute break, um, and uh, we'll be back because we're drinking from the fire hose, and I have a lot. Um, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. This is the key. 
the Pharisees had said the vows to the Lord. Um, but you can make vows on other things. I swear by my mother's grave. You know, how many times have we heard people say stuff like that? Um, you shall fulfill, fulfill your vows to the Lord, but I say you take no oath at all, neither by heaven, for it is the throne of God, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you take an oath by your head, for you cannot make a single hair. No, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, but make sure your statement is yes. Yes. Or no. No. Anything beyond these is of evil origin. If you have to make a vow, what does that say about your character? What does it say? You know? And that's what Christ is saying here. When you, when um, you say a vow, what do you mean? Um, when you I, I swear on my mother's grave. Oh, I okay. oh, swear on something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't be trusted. Now, but yeah, it means it's the same thing when someone says, oh, trust me. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, oh, yeah. It should yeah. be self-evident. If you're telling me that, I don't trust you. The one I love is, you know, trust me, have I lied to you today that you know it? Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's the accurate statement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but the, the Pharisees have said that uh, um, you could make vows um, and you like break. swearing on the Bible, basically. Like yeah, people, yeah. Oh, I swear on the Bible. Yeah. Like, swear on my children's life, mm -hmm. things like that. And, you know, so the Pharisees were saying, well, you can break a vow as long as it's not to the Lord, you know. Glenn and I had a family member who would make all kinds of promises, and then when it wasn't convenient anymore, say, I take my promise back. Uh -huh. How meaningful is that? Are you going to trust the guy? You know, absolutely not. Um, it's <laughs> cowardice. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not show opposition against an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other one towards him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak. Also, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. What this is referring to is a Roman centurion by law could come up to anybody and say, take my pack, you're going to carry it for one mile. Um, they couldn't ask you to go any further. Jesus is saying, no, go two miles. Uh, uh, you know, <coughs> go with him. Uh, give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from one who wants to borrow from you. An eye for an eye, from the Old Testament perspective, was a limit. It was not a command, you shall get revenge. Uh, of equal amount. Um, in the, the Near Eastern culture, the common thing to do if one was offended was to repeat the offense oftentimes times two, times ten, times however many. The Old Testament eye for eye was to limit that. Um, and Jesus here is saying, no. Just no. Uh, Yeah, you may have a right to it. You may have a right to it. But do we always have to claim our rights? Did Jesus claim all of his rights? No. No. I have to be honest, when I'm wrong, I want justice. But if I have made a mistake, I want grace. Jesus is saying, give the grace to the one who wrongs you. You've heard it said, <coughs> you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Pharisees. Uh, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Let's remember, going back to Genesis, after the fall, what's one of the first things that God did? He went to the garden in the cool of the morning to begin the process of reestablishing fellowship. Uh, you know, it's, 
and Adam and Eve were <coughs> going to enmity with God at that time. And he's going there to reestablish. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, do they not do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? Therefore, get this one, guys. You shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How high is the bar now? Again, the bar is now made of an opinion that hadn't been before. It goes back to creation, though. We were made in his image, mm -hmm. so we we're supposed to be Christ-like. Yeah, yeah. It goes back to creation. We were made as an image. We're supposed to be Christ-like. Um, be perfect as your heavenly Father is. That's just, wow. Uh, we need God's grace, and that's what Christ is pointing to. I'm going to jump ahead to uh, chapter 6, verse 7. And when you're praying, do not use thoughtless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Yeah, God knows our needs, but He wants us to come to Him both as an act of worship as well as to strengthen in our minds a sense of gratitude and need for God. Gratitude to and need for God. And then he gives the model, the Lord's Prayer. Pray then this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The first starts with worship. How many of us jump in with our dumbstruck load of requests? Prayer starts with worship. Remember who we're talking to. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It then moves on to acknowledge God's will and asking for the same thing to be done here. Then, after that, after worship, after acknowledging God's will, then we move to supplication. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, here's my frustration, guys. Do you want daily bread? Want I don't. Right now. Yeah, I don't want daily bread. What I want is a 20-year annuity at 12 and a half percent. I don't want to have to ask every day. But there's something healthy when we are in that position of having to ask every day because we are reminded who is the provider. Who is the provider? So no, it's not a 20-year uh, annuity at 12.5%. Below the horizon. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then Jesus goes on, I love this, to give an explanation of only one part of the prayer. Have you guys noticed this before? Because this, this is again it's beautiful. He gives an explanation of only one part of the prayer, and that is the forgiveness of others. For if we have been forgiven, how can we then not forgive? He goes on to say, an explanation, for if you forgive other people their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Wow. But if you do not forgive other people, your heavenly Father will not forgive your offenses. Again, guys, <coughs> worship is can be considered in how we treat one another. Jesus did go on and give an explanation of the worship part of the prayer, did he? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He didn't try to explain that. He tried to explain, gave extra emphasis to the point of us forgiving others, forgiving our brother. Because no matter how horrific we find the offense of the person, they are still made as God's image. They are still our brother. Uh, now I'm going to jump ahead a bit, but first I'm going to ask the question. 
Which is easier? We touched on this briefly. To give high sounding words or show that you can meet the needs of the individuals <coughs> around you? Right, it's showing that you can meet the needs, right? Um, that would be an authentication that of Jesus' teaching. So that is part of the reason for Christ's miracles. On the other part, of course, is simply his compassion. And we it's not just authentication, it's also his compassion. Now, the first miracle recorded, Glenn and I were talking about this on the drive down. Uh, John 2, <coughs> 1 to 11, when at the wedding feast, Jesus turns water not just into wine, but into the best wine the wine steward had ever had. Um, the significance to this is that we see Jesus' ministry is transformational. And given the context, indicative of the joy of the kingdom. Let's jump ahead now to Matthew 8 and see another miracle. I love this one. Can I ask yeah. the compassion and that miracle was for his mother, correct? Yes, yeah. And for everybody at the wedding, too. Okay. Uh, he, was, he was acknowledged to you know his mother's uh, request. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him, and a man with leprosy came to him. Now, a leper is ceremonially unclean. Um, they cannot touch anybody else. They cannot be touched. Um, they cannot really interact. A man with leprosy came to him, bowed down before him, and said, love this phrase, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He's putting his faith not in the result. He's putting his faith in Christ. If you are willing, you can make me clean. And it's hard hard not to tear up at this. Jesus reached out with his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now this is super significant on so many things. Again, you know, there are so many name it and claim it uh, pastors out there where your faith is supposed to be that you're going to get what you want. Well, this guy had his faith in the right place. If you are willing, you can make me clean. His faith is in Christ. Also, there had not been a healing of leprosy uh, since Miriam in the book of Numbers. Uh, nobody had been healed of leprosy. It's often asked, well, why didn't Jesus work within the system? He could have gotten so much more done. Yeah, slacker. Um, here's the deal. Jesus tried. This is his business card. This man cleansed of leprosy to go to the chief priests and then give the offerings of one who has been cleansed of leprosy. That's his business card. You guys are looking for the Messiah? I'm here. Here's the proof. Come on. Talk to me. Talk to me. Sending this man to the priest to commit the offering. Moses had commanded for the healing of leprosy was his business card. They just didn't want to hear it. He wasn't one of the good old boys. There are many more miracles chronicled, and I just want to hit on one more, uh, chapter 8, verse 5. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, begging him, saying, well, this is a centurion, guys. Um, this guy has a lot of soldiers under his command. This is a high-ranking officer. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, terribly tormented. But well, wait a minute. This is a Gentile. This is a Roman. This is a man showing compassion and asking God to meet a need, not for him, for somebody else. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word. And my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, 
and with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. To another one, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into outer darkness. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Sons of Abraham, slide on down. We're going to talk about people of faith. People who trust me, Christ. Uh, I'm not Christ. Uh, again, Jesus makes it clear the lineage of Abraham is not the key to the kingdom. It is the acceptance of grace through faith. Even for an occupier, a Roman, the enemy. Now I'm going to jump to uh, Matthew 13, 1. One of the most, in my opinion, uh, misunderstood parables, the parable of the sower. Ah, we all knew the parable of the sower, don't we? I remember the first time I heard that. Houston, Texas. I was 16 years old. Had a Young Life Bible study, sitting out by a friend's pool, this time of year. So if you've ever been to Houston, the best word to describe it is sultry. Um, and you can smell the decay in the garden and the over-chlorinated pool. So this odd mix of sterility <coughs> and decay. And the Bible study leader going through the parable of the soils and then very sternly. So, which soil? What are you going to do about it? And we went around and uh, confessed our sins, as many as, many as a 16-year-old I have, um, and left feeling utterly defeated, absolutely guilty, and utterly helpless. Chapter 13, 1. On that day, Jesus had gone out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate them. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up immediately because they had no depth of soil. But after the sun rose, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. But others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times as much. And the one who has ears, let him hear. Let's get ahead to Jesus' explanation here. Listen then to the parable of the storm. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one sown on the, with seed beside the road. The one sown with seed on rocky places, this is the one who hears the word and immediately see, receives it with joy, but yet has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution occurs, because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one sown with seed among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, and the anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown with seed on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some 100, some 60, some 30 times as much. Okay. Here's my question for you guys. Can soil cultivate itself? 
No. Can soil toss out rocks of its own accord? No. no. Can soil <coughs> read itself? No. Whose job is it to do that? It's the job of the, of the soul, right? I mean, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is Jesus isn't giving a guilt trip. He's giving a model of discipleship. And discipleship, properly understood, oftentimes begins before a person knows Christ. It is our jobs, guys, to get our hands dirty, to interact with people, to try to figure out, you know, what's, what's the soil? You know, do we need to pull weeds? Do we need to pull rocks? Um, you know, and when, when do we share? We can be sharing continuously. Um, but we need to be understanding that if we are going to be making disciples, we're going to get our hands dirty. And God's giving us here a model of discipleship, not a model of guilt trips. Um, I don't hear it taught that often. Um, I usually hear it more in the guilt trip mode. I don't know about you guys. You're getting a lot of nods, none of the dog, you know, dog head tilts. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, that's what we have here. And I want us to take that seriously because we're supposed to be, as you are going, the proper translation, make disciples, not only of the world. Well, we're supposed to be doing that. Um, and how many <coughs> churches have a Sunday school program and call that the discipleship program of the church? That's education. That's education. Um, discipleship starts before somebody knows Christ. It's us getting our hands dirty. It's us interacting with the soil because we love somebody. Uh, and we love them enough to want them to come to know Christ. Um, so that's that. Um, wow, I finished a lot faster than I thought. Um, yeah. Any questions, guys? You know, sometimes I think that um, there's this parable, you might sow a seed on good soil, but you might never see the fruit of your labor. Thank you. But that is not important. We yeah. don't have to see it. It's not about us. Mm -hmm. And it's hard sometimes to, and I have a son, my oldest son is a non-believer. He's getting married to a man. It's very hard. And it was hard for me to not to, to, to sow seeds in them, <coughs> but him say, no, I, I, I can't, you know, and then we just step back and not be in his life, but but have faith that God, in his mercy and grace, is going to either bring somebody else to water that seed, and I don't have to see it. Yeah, that's, that's very good. What Connie is saying here is, you know, we may not see the results. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't sow. Uh, you know, we may not see... Uh, what's going on? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chapter from your life. Uh, I'm pointing at my wife. Um, um, we've done decades of missions work before. Um, and uh, the Glenda was sharing with a man in Russia um, who had lost all of his family in the Russian war in Afghanistan, if I have this correct, mm -hmm. and was really rejecting very much of what Glenda had to say, um, but remained very on, on very friendly terms. Um, well, Linda, you know, it was time for her to move on, and she was going on to talk to the next person. And the man came out and said to that next person, listen to what she has to say. What she has to say is good. Um, well, you know, there's a change of heart there. Um, so uh, there's also in Argentina, this is one of my favorite stories, we were working with La Vida, uh, Word of Life Institute, and we were doing door-to-door -door evangelism. And... Uh, Glenda shared with the young man, at this tall. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, thinking things were going well. Um, you're never really sure, you know, you're on a short term mission trip, you're never really sure about the fruit. But uh, we were back that time, the same time of next year, and we were in Flava de Vida, the seminary there, and this guy comes up behind me, Glenda reaches up, and I said, <laughs> Taps her on the shoulder. 
Well, was the guy that she had shared the gospel with, and now he's a student in seminary. Um, so, yeah. So I mean, it may take. You know, Paul said, you know, I planted Apollos watered. Um, you know, it, it's going to take. If you're really, really blessed, um, I'm convinced that a lot of times people who have what we call the gift of evangelism are people whom God says, I know your faith is so weak that you need to see an instant result. You know, so I'm going to give you instant results. Um, the person who really has a ton of faith is the person who keeps sowing the seeds even if they don't see the results. Because the power in the seed is what the Greek translation is automatica. Uh, the power in the seed, we get our word automatic. The power isn't in the sower. No, we are supposed to tend the soil. We are supposed to cultivate. We are supposed to weed. We are supposed to pull the rocks. But the power for germination exists within the seed. And the seed is God's word. And God promises his word will no, not go forth in vain. So, that's that. Um, any questions? Yeah, Ken. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that the Holy Spirit's the water? That's a good question. Yeah, is it, is it fair to say that the Holy Spirit the Calvinist is the view. I'm sorry? I'm thinking of the Calvinist view where um, everything is <coughs> God. We do nothing, basically. Yeah. So, to fear with that parable, yeah. the seed gets sown then it's the Holy Spirit that does the watering, which is the word that makes it grow. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to disagree slightly, uh, because every system, uh, is the Holy Spirit the, the one who does the watering? Yes and no. Um, the Calvinist view uh, that um, Kevin pointed out is that basically nothing depends on us. Um, that it's all God. I'm going to say, yes, it is all God, but God invites us to work where he is working. And uses us. That's why Paul can say, "I planted, but Apollos watered." Um, uh, so, yeah, um, the whole thing on. Um, I know some ultra Calvinists who have no take no responsibility in their lives whatsoever because it is all predestined. You know, um, therefore I can walk out in front of a car, and if I get hit, it's not my fault. No, that's not my. I'm sorry. Um, the reality is God is at work around us, and he gives us the gift. Now I'm going to jump into the Pauline epistles. Uh, again, we were talking about uh, domains and God calling forth from domains to fill those domains. God also, in the Pauline epistles, we see, created a domain of good works that we can then walk in. And that's a gift. Um, and any time that we have where we can share God's word, that's a gift um, to us. That God's going to choose to use us. Does he need to? No. That's how he chooses to bless. So, did, that, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Okay. It's just Calvinism, there's a resurgence of it in, yes. in the church. Uh, we, we personally don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. I'm actually blown out. Bible study over it. Um, yeah. So, but it, there is a big resurgence of Calvinism around the world. There, there is. There's a huge resurgence of it, and I'm not going to say. I'm it not basically saying, takes away our free will. Yeah, it takes away our free will, yeah. and um, the, the I'm not going to be hypercritical of any um, systematic theology because guess what? Every systematic theology is a human construct. Yeah. And every systematic theology, therefore, is going to have its flaws. I love how, <coughs> bless you, bless you. So, that's, that's it, that's it, you're done. <laughs> um, I love how uh, my friend Lanier Burns, who is the head of the Department of Systematic Theology at Dallas Theological Seminary, still is, a frightening and bright individual. Um, I love how Lanier once said, that the, the founders of the seminary were men who had absolutely, utterly, crystallinely pure theology. But the problem was that they didn't know what love was. Ouch. And what are we seeing here? What are we seeing in the Pentateuch? 
What's God most concerned with? The offering or the relationship between us? Yeah. It's the relationship between us. The acknowledgement that, oh, I wronged you. Lo siento. I feel. And have the courage to say that. And see that as an act of worship. Oh, yeah. So mine and the branches to me are a perfect demonstration. I mean, when I finally understood that, it's like everything is perfect. Yeah. You know, it was just so cool. Yeah, the, the vine and the branches, absolutely. Um, <coughs> what we've, uh, you know, and I hope you guys understand. I'm so glad that uh, you guys are taking both the bookends because you're seeing grace in the Pentateuch, aren't you? Yeah. Are you seeing any contradictions here at all? No, but what you're seeing is restoration. You know, we're seeing restoration. Um, and you know, God forbid that we ever become Pharisees, that we ever uh, lose track of that grace, of that love. Let it never be said of us that we have a crystalline and pure theology and don't know love. Ouch. Okay. I will see you guys on Tuesday.